Good morning. I'm Hay Kazazian. I have the great pleasure and privilege of introducing Stuart Orkin, the 2014 recipient of the William Allen Award, the highest honor of our society. Orkin's research is unmatched for its cumulative impact on the genetic basis of blood diseases and fundamental aspects of mammalian development. His work is a paradigm for the application of molecular genetics to medicine. Stu was born to, to native New Yorkers and grew up in Manhattan. Whoops, I want to go back. There's, there he is at summer camp. His father was a urologist who made house calls. When Stu was in fourth grade, the family moved to Riverdale, New York, where he attended a private boys' school. At Riverdale, he had a chemistry teacher who stimulated him to attend MIT. After flirting with physics, he quickly learned that MIT had many physics whizzes. So after Salvador Luria's biology course on early molecular genetics, he decided to pursue biology. Stu then attended Harvard Medical School beginning in 1967, and around 1970, he took a year of research with John Littlefield to do somatic cell genetics. After NIH paid for his fourth year in medical school, there he is, he did an internship at Boston Children's. He then went to work at NIH with Phil Leder, an esteemed molecular geneticist. What a great deal and terrific mentor he had. With Leder, Orkin learned pre-cloning molecular biology. Around this time, I met him for the first time and was quite impressed. After NIH, he returned to Children's for a residency year, and David Nathan, the astute director of hematology oncology at the time, offered Orkin the opportunity to start his own lab while still a Hemonc fellow. The rest is history. Personally, he met his wonderful wife, Roz, while both were in college. They've been married 44 years. They have one daughter and two grandchildren, ages five and three. I had the great pleasure of collaborating with Stu in the early 1980s on the characterization of mutations causing beta thalassemia in various ethnic groups, Mediterraneans, Asian Indians, Chinese, among others. Stilionis Antonaracus, then a fellow, found a number of new RFLPs in the beta globin gene cluster that produced nine major haplotypes. Had different beta thalassemia mutations landed on different haplotypes? We picked mutant beta globin genes that Stu then cloned and sequenced. Indeed, among nine different Mediterranean haplotypes with beta thalassemia, there were eight different mutations affecting transcription, RNA splicing, and translation. What fun this was. Stu would call almost daily with new information. He stayed at our home as we finished the first paper in late 1981. Over the next five years, we wrote 25 other papers covering beta thalassemia mutations in other ethnic groups. But this molecular characterization of Mendelian disease was just the first of many breakthroughs for Orkin. In 1986, he used the XP21 deletion found by Uta Franca and help from Tony Monaco and Lou Kunkel to carry out the first positional cloning of any gene, the CYBB gene mutated in chronic granulomatous disease. In 1989, Orkin found the first transcriptional regulator of hematopoiesis, GATA1. He followed that with discovery of many other transcription factors important for blood cell development. Orkin then used gene targeting 
in mice to determine in, vit in vivo roles for many of these transcriptional regulators in blood stem cells or hematopoietic lineages. Because of this work, Orkin is considered the father of molecular hematopoiesis. Recently, Orkin has made another stunning discovery that represents the first inroad into the most important unsolved area in hemoglobin disorders, regulation of the switch from fetal to adult hemoglobin. He found that repressing BCL11A leads to increased fetal hemoglobin and restoration of the normal phenotype in the mouse model of sickle cell anemia. Orkin may now have a rational approach to curing sickle cell anemia and beta thalassemia by increasing fetal hemoglobin, a holy grail of hematology for many years. Stu has received many honors, including election to the Institute of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the National Academy of Science. Among his many awards is the 2013 Kovalenko Medal of the National Academy of Science, awarded for important contributions to medical science. Here he is celebrating with his lab. He has published over 500 scientific papers, including 225 with greater than 100 citations. His mentoring of many graduate students and postdocs is legendary. Among his distinguished mentees, are David Ginsburg, Leonard Zahn, Nancy Andrews, and ex-colleagues at Penn, Celeste Simon, Gerd Blobel, and Mitch Weiss. After a successful career in genetics, I wonder if Orkin may be going into politics. This is a recent photo with Roosevelt and Churchill. Seriously, as a scientist working between fundamental biology and human disease, Orkin has contributed enormously to the development of molecular medicine and genetics. These accomplishments are highly worthy of recognition with the 2014 Allen Award to Stuart Orkin. Thank you very much, Egg. First, I'm enormously grateful to the Society for this honor. Uh, it's uh, really a great one to be among the previous winners. Although I've never held an, appo uh, an appointment in genetics, I've never worked in a genetics division, but rather have dwelled in the realm of hematology and oncology, I've always thought of myself as a geneticist, and perhaps today's honor confirms my suspicions. I would not be here today if it weren't for my wife, Rosalind, who you've seen in the pictures already, who's given steadfast support, and the rest of my family, including Jane, a daughter who's back in Boston. I'm going to walk through some of the same territory that Haig mentioned briefly and give you perhaps my own view on some of those years. This is where it all began, I think, in the second year course of Salvador Aluria. Uh, it was not the biology I knew from high school, cutting up frogs and the like. This was the early days of molecular genetics. And this was a soft science, as we've already heard before from Mark at MIT at the time. There were very few biology majors. Uh, everyone else went into physics or engineering. I encountered other luminaries at the same time, including Boris Magasanek and Vern Ingram. And although I couldn't have predicted it at the time, the lab TAs I had, Bob Weinberg and David Botstein, would become stars in their own right. I migrated across the river to Harvard Medical School as a student and actually would have received both an MD and a PhD had Harvard allowed that. At the time, Harvard said you could have one degree, an MD was enough for Kornberg, so it's enough for you. We were encouraged to take a year off from medical school, and that's when I worked with John Littlefield at the MGH. Rather than uh, joining the Army, I joined the Public Health Service in Bethesda at that time, in Phil Leader's lab. Uh, and at that time, I could devote myself to molecular biology, the sort of pre-cloning days 
for two years without any responsibilities other than that. I learned how to purify messenger RNA, prepare reverse transcriptase from infected chicken blood, and purify EcoR1 restriction enzyme, all ancient history now. What I did learn was how to do experiments without a kit and how to do clean experiments, direct experiments to answer specific questions. We hoped to learn how globin messenger RNA was expressed, even though we didn't have any clue at the time what the structure of the genes were. But my experience in the leader lab set me on a lifelong quest to understand blood cell development. After leaving the leader lab, I returned to Boston to Children's Hospital to continue clinical training, both in pediatrics and hematology. And then David Nathan, now recognized as a true giant in academic medicine, gave me the opportunity to begin a laboratory when Bernie Forget moved to Yale. Bernie Forget was an early pioneer in hemoglobin biology, uh, and there was a vacancy in the department. So Dr. Nathan said I should write to the NIH and the March of Dimes, obtain funding, which was my startup funds, and begin a laboratory. Not knowing anything better at the time, that's what I did, and we focused on red cell biology. And tried to answer these questions. Successively, however, my career has transitioned through the introduction of recombinant DNA methods, prenatal diagnosis by DNA, positional cloning, stem cell biology, the new genetics of GWAS, and now genome engineering. In many respects, this fortunate history traces modern molecular science in biomedicine. With my newly established laboratory, I set out to try to understand beta thalassemia, this disorder where the beta chain of hemoglobin is not produced adequately. And from that, as you've already heard, teamed up with Hay Kazazian and Stelios Antonarakis using a, a, a rather clever system that Haig had uh, predicted would work, that is, dissecting various haplotypes. And we sequenced the globin gene from each haplotype, and in rather short order, identified that the haplotypes predicted the various mutations in the populations, and ultimately, developed the first comprehensive analysis of beta thalassemia, perhaps the first disorder for which we knew all the molecular lesions. This was comforting, but really didn't answer the question of how red cells were made. But knowing the defects involved in this disorder facilitated, if I go forwards, I think I'm, can we go forwards? I think we're going backwards. Okay. There we go. Okay. Prenatal diagnosis. This is the island of Sardinia. It's an old slide, but the introduction of prenatal diagnosis in Sardinia has virtually eliminated the birth of new affected children. While thinking about the next thing to do to get to the bottom of red cell development, I did take a detour, as Haig mentioned, in collaboration with Lou Kunkel and Tony Monaco, who are a couple of floors below us in the research building, to identify the gene for chronic granulomatous disease, which was a classic immune disorder actually studied by my mentor, Dr. Nathan, many years before. Although the task of cloning the gene seems simple these days, at the time we could not take advantage of PCR, which hadn't come on the scene at that time, and we had rudimentary sequencing methods as well. And the cloning of this gene has led to important insights into major host defense system of white blood cells. We still wanted to get back to these questions, however. Really, how is the red cell made? And for this, we turned to the nucleus and identified the first transcription factor that actually is the master regulator for the erythroid lineage and the first cell-specific hematopoietic transcription factor. We focused on a portion of the gamma globin promoter at the time, the fetal promoter, because there were mutations in that promoter which upregulated exp expression fortuitously in so-called hereditary persistence of fetal hemoglobin. We thought we'd identify a factor responsible for fetal hemoglobin production, but in fact identified a distranscription factor, GATA1, which drives the expression of virtually all genes in erythroid cells. 
Gata 1 has been particularly remarkable in providing a window into diverse biology, including lineage differentiation, lineage choice, lineage programming, basic aspects of transcription, roles of the five other members of this transcription factor family. We've identified rare anemias and thrombocytopenias, and this gene is also involved in leukemogenesis. Having trouble, can we go forwards? This work then led to what Haig described as the sequential identification and gene knockout of transcription factors to in fact identify virtually the, all the major regulators and their roles in hematopoiesis, which is overlaid on the typical hierarchy from stem cells to mature cells thereafter. Go ahead, one. But really the problem we wanted to address again was the disorders of hemoglobin. And the particular one that we focused on most recently and thought about is sickle cell disease, the first molecular disease coined by Linus Pauling and the first amino acid substitution identified uh, in a molecular disorder, that by Vernon Ingram, one of my previous mentors at MIT. Sometimes we think that these disorders have been solved because we know quite a bit about the molecular biology. But in fact, this is a view of the world with the expanded region showing the incidence of the hemoglobinopathies, particularly sickle cell disease, where in the African continent, it's predicted there'll be more than 5 million affected children in just a few years. So this is a global health problem uh, that is not yet under control. We've known for many years that increased fetal hemoglobin is beneficial if one has one of these disorders as it protects against, in the case of sickle, the sickling phenomenon and anemia and prolonged survival. This is the critical um, step in globin expression. That is the switch from gamma uh, fetal gene to the adult beta globin gene, which has been the puzzle for many, many years. We and others have studied this problem in a number of ways, if we can go to the next slide, and it's been studied since the 1950s from the standpoint of human genetics and family studies, been studied from transcription factors, sequencing of the beta globin cluster was performed more than 30 years ago, results that did not impact our understanding of the process at all. And it was genome-wide association studies a little more than five years ago which provided the key break. If we can go one slide forward. And this was the genome-wide association study performed both in the UK by Swilly Thien and also in Sardinia by Antonio Cowan and colleagues showing three uh, major hits. The major hit that we studied is that of B-cell-11A on the short arm of chromosome two. The other two had been identified by traditional linkage studies before. And this is the Manhattan plot showing the Empire State Building, emphasizing where we've looked. And this is the kind of variation one sees in this kind of population study, with the low haplotype homozygous giving about 3 or 4 percent fetal hemoglobin, and the high giving about 10 or 11 percent, a significant change, but not enough to ameliorate disease. What we've learned in the ensuing years is that B-cell of an A is essentially a quantitative regulator of fetal hemoglobin. If you dial up B cell 11A, you dial down fetal hemoglobin, and conversely, if you reduce the expression of B cell 11A, you induce fetal hemoglobin. In fact, we can rescue sickle cell mice. These are humanized mice containing the sickle cell mutation in a human construct. We can rescue it by cell-specific or conditional deletion of B cell 11A in the erythroid lineage, and we restore the hematology to normal because we induce fetal hemoglobin at a high level. What's most remarkable about this is the differentiation and production of red cells is entirely normal in the absence of B cell of an A, virtually unheard of with any other transcription factor we or others have studied. We go forward. This is a genetic circuitry then with a genome-wide association study identifying on chromosome two B cell of an A as a regulator of fetal hemoglobin, and we believe it acts directly within the cluster. But what's the basis of this variation? 
The highly uh, correlated SNPs for this GWAS lie within a big intron of the B cell evidence gene, about 40 kilobases, and this region is, is interdigitated with DNA's hypersensitive sites, with their, which are cell specific, uh, and with transcription factor binding as well. So this looked like a regulatory element, and in fact, introduction of this region into transgenic mice uh, produces expression of the reporter gene, LAC-C, in the fetal liver and in adult erythroid cells, indicating that this is a cell-specific and adult-specific transcriptional enhancer. In order to, to look at the function of this enhancer in greater detail, we've used genome-wide engin genome engineering using modified zinc fingers, talons, to remove the enhancer from mouse cells to see what is the contribution of the enhancer itself to gene expression. And the results are really quite remarkable. Removal, removal of the enhancer leads to a virtually a hundredfold reduction in B cell MNA expression in erythroid cells, but not in B cells where B cell MNA is also expressed. And we contrast this with the difference in uh, the naturally occurring uh, variation in genome-wide association here, which we believe is about a 40% reduction in expression. So what we believe is the situation is in the normal, we produce this repressor. Natural genetic variation in GWAS leads to perhaps a 40% reduction and some relief of fetal hemoglobin repression, but not complete. And in the absence of B11A, we see virtually no expression of B11A and um, large expression of fetal hemoglobin. One other fact which has come uh, uh, on the scene very recently, it's not yet published, is by a colleague, Vijay Sankaran, a remarkable trainee of mine, uh, who's now faculty. And this is, comes from individuals, rare individuals, who are haploid sufficient for B cell MNA due, due to a deletion on one chromosome and a normal copy on the other chromosome. These individuals have a severe autism-like syndrome, and for the most part, their hemoglobin F hasn't been measured because these patients are under the care of neurologists or other uh, medical specialists. However, Dr. Sankaran obtained two families and measured hemoglobin F in the heterozygous, the haploid insufficiency, and there's about 15 to 20 percent hemoglobin F, which is in the range of the classical HPFH mutations, which in their homozygous state certainly uh, correct uh, sickle cell or thalassemia if one had it, but in the case of the heterozygous is enough to ameliorate disease. So we think that even haploid insufficiency for this gene would actually correct the major hemoglobinopathies. So this has led to the prediction or the hypothesis that we now could use genome engineering to actually address this gene uh, and the patients for cure. In this case, collecting hematopoietic stem cells, introducing some sequence-specific uh, nucleases, either zinc fingers or uh, more uh, later versions such as Cas9, um, uh, guide RNAs to, to disrupt the enhancer and then introduce these cells back into patients in a standard bone marrow transplantation, or really a modified and improved form of gene therapy in which there are no residual sequences left behind. We've just, in this case, taken out the repressor for fetal hemoglobin. And this is actually moving along quite rapidly in preclinical studies, and we believe within the next 18 months to two years, they'll actually be the first experiments we hope performed. While that, the genetic solution is, is really very attractive, it obviously doesn't solve the public health and the global health problem. We really need a small molecule, a pill, which can then reduce the activity or the expression of B11A. Of course, drugging the uh, transcription factors is called drugging the undruggable by the pharmaceutical industry. But we think with sophisticated protein chemistry and chemical design, it should be possible to reduce the activity, perhaps sufficiently, maybe 50%, in order to actually induce fetal hemoglobin in a safe manner in the many thousands of patients with this disorder. And I believe that's really the challenge for the future, to really move this from genetics now, really to chemical biology and chemistry. Uh, so to enter yet another field, perhaps, as I continue my career. Really what I'd like to do, though, is thank all the trainees who have shared scientific discovery with me in the laboratory, 
all my colleagues in Boston who've created an exciting environment in which to explore blood, and the funding agencies, particularly the NIH, Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, DDK, the Howard Hughes uh, Institute as well, and particularly the mentors I mentioned and the great institutional support I've had in Boston for my encouragement. And I'd like to thank you for your attention.